for joining us for this our last Bible study. We have had nine Bible studies on the subject of how does truth show up in the scriptures and why should we pursue truth. For nine weeks we have been talking about this subject. And so I pray that you have been blessed. If you have not viewed our teachings, please go back and look at uh, all of them if you are able to do so. If not, just look at segments of these uh, different teachings. Truly, I have been blessed. I have been blessed. This teaching has allowed me to delve into God's word and I thank God for the opportunity to have done so. And so I pray that you were blessed by this opportunity to share in these studies because they truly have been a blessing to me. Let us pray. God, we thank you so much for allowing us to, to be here we ask, oh God, that you bless those who will view this video when it airs on Thursday, uh, the 8th of August at 7 p.m. I pray, oh Lord God, for those who will look at this video after it has aired. Thank you for those, oh Lord, who will be on, uh, on Thursday, the 8th of, of August when we will be live chatting and following we will be on clubhouse sharing the same bible study so god thank you for these last nine weeks that you have sustained me to to be in your presence and to share your word it's in jesus name we pray amen well we will be coming from the book of Job. We have been using the methodology of uh, a basic Bible study where we walk through nine different steps to help us to absorb God's word. So, let's get into the book of Job. First of all, we know that Job consists primarily of poetic speeches framed by a narrative that opens and closes the story. The righteous Job experiences great suffering and hold fast to his belief in his righteousness despite his friend's insistence that sin is the reason for his suffering. When God finally responds to Job's cries, he emphasizes his total sovereignty. In the end, Job acknowledges God's sovereignty and has his fortunes restored. We'll be coming from Job, the 33rd chapter, verses 1 through 7. And you know, when we start out our Bible studies, initially we want the scriptures to speak to us before we look at any commentaries or any resources that will be of benefit to us. We want the scriptures to initially speak to us. And so as we walk the text, we want to make note of what the scriptures are saying to us initially. And so I have done so for these past nine weeks, and this evening is no different. So it starts out by saying, so have I become your enemy by telling you the truth. Job was under the impression that he had become an enemy of God because he stood on what he believed to be his, his righteousness because of the life in which he led. You know that when his sons and daughters were over one son's house initially in the text, they were drinking and having fun. 
Job knew that they were doing things that weren't pleasing to God, so Job would sacrifice on behalf of his children because he knew that they were in the wrong in regards to God, disregarding God. And so Job felt a sense of righteousness because of his life, the life in which he led before God. But we know that in the, in the heavens, uh, Satan came and asked God if he could strike Job. And God gave Satan permission to do so. So in my note here, I said, our or oh, your, please forgive my grammar. I, I be writing these notes pretty quickly and I don't go back and check them which we have been, uh, our, we've been focusing on truth and can, and truth can be offensive to some, but transformative for others. Truth can be uh, informative to others and, and can be offensive to some. And so we see here, he says here, they eagerly seek you, not commendably, but they wish to shut you out so that you will seek them. And I made a note to say that I don't know who is the they, but apparently they want nothing to do with, uh, and this is a note that got mixed up. Oh Lord, please forgive me. Please forgive me. I'm looking at the wrong I'm looking at the wrong text. Lord have mercy. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. Job 33 verses 1 through 7. Please forgive me. Okay. However now Job. Let's go back. Job. However now Job. He says please hear my speech. And listen to all my words. And I made a note to say that Job wants, wants to respond to those who are questioning him on his integrity, especially before God. Then it says, Behold now, I open my mouth, my tongue in my mouth speaks. And I put a, made a note to say we must stand and speak to those who are questioning our integrity. We must stand and speak to those who are questioning our integrity. He says here, my tongue in my mouth speaks. Then he says, my words are from the unrighteousness of my heart. And my lips speak knowledge sincerely. And I made a note to say his words, Job, are considered uprightness of heart. And his knowledge is sincere. But he didn't have the whole picture. He only had a partial picture. It says here, the Spirit of God has made me and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. Job knew, please forgive my grandma again, Job knew that God's Spirit made him and us. And the breath of the Almighty gives him life and us the same. He says, refute me if you can. Array yourselves before me. Take your stand. I said Job wants those to refute him. Arraying themselves before him. Taking their stand. He says here. Behold. I belong to God like you. He says I too have been formed out of the clay. He's speaking what he believed to be truth. 
We all belong to God, and even Job believes that being formed from the clay of the earth. He's speaking truth there. He says, Behold, no fear of me should terrify you, nor should my pressure weigh heavenly on you. I said, Job should not fear anyone, and we should not do the same. Amen. So, where do we go from here? Well, we've highlighted how the scriptures were speaking to us. And so our next step tells us to do what we believe to be. It says, reading your passage in more than one translation can improve your understanding of the passage. Differences in translations may indicate places where the interpretation of the text is debated or the differences may reflect different approaches to translations, like sticking close to the wording of the original verses, adapting the wording to make it sound natural in the language of translation. So when we look, we see here where it says, however now Job pleases, now it says, however now, this is the New American Standard Version of the Bible, 1995. This is my primary Bible. It says, however now, Job, please hear my voice. Listen to all my words. And then this translation here says, but now please hear my speeches. Job, and hear all of my words. So we see the word speeches and Job added. In English Standard Version says, but... But now, okay, hear my speech, O oh, Job, and listen to all my words. New International Version says, But now, Job, listen to my words. Pay attention to everything I say, which is 44% different than my primary Bible because they add the words, Pay attention to everything I say. Those are additional words to make. The scripture more plain instead of us instead of saying however now Job please hear my speech and list all of my words and so we see where there are differences in translation we do one additional one it says here behold now I open my mouth my tongue is in my in my mouth speaks this version says please look I open my mouth my tongue is in my mouth, speaks. Behold, I open my mouth. English Standard Version, the tongue in my mouth speaks. New International Version says, I am about to open my mouth. My words are in the tip of my tongue. So Job is about to speak. It says here to make note of one or two differences in the text. Of the translations you have read of your passage, how do the differences affect your understanding of the passage? Are they simply saying the same thing in different words, or do they reflect different understandings of the passage? And what I wrote here is that Job wants his audience to hear what he has to say to them, bringing attention to himself because he's about to speak. Uh, his words are from the uprightness of his heart, and he wants to speak sincerely to his audience. Job realized the Spirit of God had made him in us, and God's breath gives him life as well as our lives too. Looking for those who would refute him, and if they are able to answer him, Wanting his audience to stand and argue their case before him. Job and us would want to belong to God, realizing he uh, has formed us from clay. Job should not be dreaded, and nor should we be dreaded. Okay. He says here, 
Identify people in your passage. Most passages include references to people and other intelligent living beings. Here we want to identify the people mentioned in the passage and explore the roles they play. You can understand your passage better if you make note of all the people involved, including individuals and groups and their roles and events. And I say here, software is showing me that Job is mentioned in the text. You see that in see that in Job 33, very first verse, it says, however, now Job, please hear my speech and listen to my words. So we know that Job is in the text. What else do we know? We also know that God is identified in the text. In 33 and 4, it says here, the Spirit of God has made me and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. So God is mentioned in the text. Job is acknowledging God. So God is in the text. Then we see the Holy Spirit is in the text. In 33 and 4, the Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. So he mentions the Holy Spirit. He mentions the Holy Spirit before the Holy Spirit has come in the New Testament. The Holy Spirit was present, and Job realized it all the way back in Job. Job is a very ancient book, and so some believe that it even comes before Genesis, but it's an ancient book. But uh, Job realizes that the Spirit of God has made him, made him, and the breath the Almighty has given him life. So the Holy Spirit is present. And then his friend Elihu. I don't know whether or not you would call him a friend. But if his friend Elihu was present also. He was present as well. And he answers him. He speaks. Elihu speaks after listening to Job in 33 33rd chapter, verse 12. Behold, let me tell you, you are not right in this, for God is greater than man. So Elihu speaks. Elihu is who he is speaking to. So I said, who are the main players in the passage, the main characters of Job, God, the Holy Spirit, and Elihu? Next, the fourth one, fourth uh Step is to examine the relationship between your passage and other passages in the Bible, letting Scripture interpret Scripture. It's been a guiding principle, biblical interpretation for centuries. The idea is that the meaning of an obscure passage might be clarified by other passages where the meaning is more straightforward. And if you recall, I've always said that you use the parallel scriptures pertaining to your text. If you go any other places and look up scripture or try to tie it together, you could be misinterpreting the scripture. Scripture is interpreted, scripture interprets itself. So you don't have to look all over the Bible trying to find something to correspond with your text. Because you very well could be taking the text out of context. So he says here, and these are some scriptures that parallel our scriptures. Where he says, remove, remove your hand from me and let not dread of you testify me. These are, he says here, then the Lord God formed the man of the dust from the ground and to breathe into his nostrils the breath of life, the man became a living being. Job mentions about coming from the dust of the earth, so that's a parallel scripture. It goes on and says here, for as long as life is in me and the breath of God is in my nostrils. These are parallel scriptures. And so it says, review each cross-reference and consider its relevance to your passage. Why is 
cross-reference relevant for your passage. And I said, Job 13, 21, remove your hand from me. And let not the dread of you terrify me. Job is literally saying if God takes his hands off of him, he's in bad shape. And so he was under the belief that God had done just that and taken his hands off of him. That God had no longer recognized him as being upright before him. But he didn't know that Satan had made a plea had bargained with God. God allowed Satan to bargain. But God knew in the end that Job would be faithful. Even though his wife said that, why don't you curse God and die? In Job 10 and 9, it says, remember now that you have made me as clay. And would you, and would you turn me into dust again? Believing that ultimately his, he was going to his death to return back to dust. That's an excellent cross reference because he mentions that in the text. Then Job 11 and 13. Job 11 and 13. See, does that come up? No, that's not coming up for me. Job 13 and 18 says, Behold, now I have prepared my case. I know that I will be vindicated. And so that's what he says here. It says, Which cross references are most important for your passage? What additional insight do the related passages provide for your understanding of your passage? And I said to Genesis 2 and 7, for all of us come from the dust of the ground and we will return to such after death. And the fifth step is review what you have studied, summarize it. Or writing a brief summary of your passage and what you have learned about it will strengthen your understanding of the passage. It'll help you remember the main points from your study. In a brief paragraph summarizing the passage and the main points, you have learned about it from your study. Job wants to defend himself before his audience of probably, of probably uh, was uh, Elihu, on which may be Elihu, probably or may, or which may be Elihu. Then number the sixth step says, look at Bible commentaries to see how others have interpreted your passage. And review the commentaries. Review the commentaries. Review the commentaries. Review the commentaries. <sighs> Yeah, review your commentaries. And so what I did was I went to this commentary, one of my favorites. Yeah, one of my favorites. Yeah, the, the Bible knowledge commentary. It says here that three times Elihu addresses Job by name. Uh, in the... Uh, Job 33 and 1, he says, However, now, Job, please hear my speech and listen to all my words. So here in Job chapter 33, verse 1, this is Elihu. It says here, However, now, Job, please hear my speech and listen to all of my words. His words weren't true. His words, we know we've been talking about how does truth show up in the scripture. Elihu's not speaking truth. He's speaking what he thinks is going on in the natural realm. Not realizing what has happened in the spiritual realm between God and Satan. You see here, he says three times Elihu addresses Job by name. He does so in uh, chapter 33, verse 31. He says, pay attention, O Job. Listen to me. Keep silent and let me speak. 
He also does the same thing in Job 37, verse 14. Listen to this, O Job. Stand and consider the wonders of God. And so three times Elihu addressed Job by name. And seven other times mentions Job's name. In contrast, the three older speakers never once mentioned Job's name either directly or indirectly. Job had asked his three friends to listen to him. Now Elihu turned that around and asked that Job hear him. The young debater had paid attention to the three, to the three, behold, I let me tell you, you are not right in this, for God is greater than man. He now has asked that Job give him his full attention. Elihu's words, which he was about to speak, they were on the tip of his tongue, were sincere from an upright heart, and would reveal insights into Job's situation. What I know, Elihu viewed himself as an equal with Job for both, he said, were created by God. Elihu said he was made by God. The Holy Spirit is involved in creating man. So it's Elihu who said he was made by God and the Holy Spirit is involved in creating man. Given life by the breath of the Almighty, Job had also said he was made by God as well. In Job, the 31st chapter, verse 15, where he said, Did not he who made me in the womb made him, and the same one fashioned us in the womb? In Job, the 33rd chapter, verse 5, the youthful speaker Elihu, after hearing Job out, challenged him to respond if he possibly could. Job, he said, should prepare his response and be ready to confront Elihu as in the verbal combat. Well, the word uh, Iraq, 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 translated prepare means to arrange in order, often in the sense of marshaling military forces or weapons in battle, order. And so figuratively to arrange one's words or legal case. Elihu was ready for a skirmish. Of course, Job had already set forth his arguments. Perhaps his numerous forays with his other so-called friends had left him battle weary. Then in Job, the 30. Third chapter, verses 6 and 7, where it says, Behold, I belong to God like you. I too have been formed out of the clay. Behold, no fear of me should terrify you, nor should my pressure weigh heavily on you. Though ready to take on Job and to show him the danger of criticizing God, Elihu did not intend to lord it over the sufferer as the three disputants, disputants had done. He admitted to, e to equality with Job because they're both frail human beings made from clay. Therefore, Job need not fear Elihu, for he would treat Job kindly. He would not terrify him as Job had said God had done. Elihu promised that in this debating he would not pressure Job. His hand would not be heavy on him as Job had said God had done. And so he looked at the commentaries. He says, record insights gained from reading the commentaries. Note specifically, especially the parts of your passage that inspire the most discussion in the commentary. Elihu had questioned Job three times, but now wanted to get down to business. 
of Job's suffering if he's an upright man before God. Have the consulted commentaries modified your understanding of the passage and in what way? I said, not exactly. The commentaries did not modify my understanding of the text. No, they did not modify my understanding of the text. And the seventh step, the seventh step, the seventh step is this. Seventh step is an important part of the Bible study. It's determining what timeless principles are taught in a passage so that you can apply those principles in your own life. The meaning of a passage will be applied differently, different times and in different places, but the underlying truths of Scripture will be applicable in some way at all times and places. Before we can apply a passage, we must understand its theological principles. So what I said here is obviously it's a mention of breath. And we know that the imagery of breath is often used to convey spiritual essence and power unseen except in its effects, including aspects of the, per of the person and work of the Holy Spirit. The main Hebrew and Greek words translated as breath and the NIV are also translated as spirit and wind. That is true. Ruach. Breath. Ruach. That's what it means in Hebrew. Ruach. Ruach. You have to kind of clear your voice when you say it. Ruach. Ruach. Okay, you also see confrontation in the text. We see confrontation is also there. Confrontation. The creation and God. The natural world is sustained by God and God and speaks of God. So we see these, these things in the scripture. Even the mention of the Holy Spirit in the, in the Old Testament. The Old Testament portrays the Holy Spirit as being active in creation and equipping individuals for skilled tasks and in inspiring prophecy and revelation. So this is where we see these thematic outlines mentioned in the text. What theological principles are communicated in your passage? Theological principles communicated in the passages are confrontations, God the Creator, and the Holy Spirit in creation. Which theological principles from your passage are most important and how might they be applied today, that illness has its purpose in our lives and others may not understand why we are going through. Oh, Lord Jesus. And then the eighth step is consider how to apply the theological principles you identified in this passage to your own life. How has this passage challenged or moved you? The passage helps me and others to see the spiritual going on behind the scenes. What issues, personal or corporate, are involved in this passage? The issues, personal or corporate, that are involved in the passage is suffering and why some don't understand the origin of why it's happening in the first place. What spiritual struggles are addressed in this passage, either directly or indirectly? The righteous in Job and what Satan was allowed to do in Job's life and how his friends question his integrity before God. What response do you think the passage should inspire in others if you shared it and your insights with them? And I said that many times we don't know the origin of suffering. We may have caused it or God may have allowed Satan to attack us to ultimately bring God the glory based on how we respond. 
based on how we respond. Amen. Based on how we respond. And the ninth is what have you learned that you should share with others? Your insight could be valuable to others. Sharing about it may encourage and enlighten your friends. Use faith life groups, social media sites, email or conversation to share your insights. Start discussions with others. Don't forget to include what steps you might plan to take in response to what you have learned. The ultimate goal of our learning and study of, of the scriptures should be a changed life, not merely acquiring more information. And I put here that I would share in a Bible study online and in club clubhouse on saturday i want to thank god for each person that thought it not robbery to be a part of our study truly you have blessed me you have blessed me just being present these last nine weeks have been a blessing to me. And so I want to thank God for each person that have viewed our videos or will view our videos in the future. There's been quite a bit shared that will be a blessing to you if you absorb and live out God's word in your life. Again, I want to say what we have tried to achieve these last nine weeks. How does truth show up in the scriptures? And why should we pursue truth? That has been our mission. That has been our mission. Elihu may have thought he was speaking truth, but all he was doing was given his opinion based on what he saw happening in the life of Job. But it wasn't exactly the truth. And that just makes us realize that sometimes we think we're sharing truth. We're speaking truth. And sometimes we don't know exactly if it is true. I would, would argue that truth is based on, God, based on God's word. And if we couch our words based on the word of God, then we can be assured that we are sharing truth. Not that we should be so holier than thou, but that we are so acquainted with the word of God that we frame our words, not wanting to hurt anyone, but just speak the truth. Just speak the truth. Our world a nation would be a better place if we spoke truth instead of instead of promoting lies. God bless you and God keep you. Let us pray. God, we thank you for the opportunity that you have truly afforded us to come before your throne and to lift up your holy name. Bless our gathering, O oh Lord God. Thank you for being in our midst. I pray, O oh Lord, for those who will view this video after it has after it has aired. And I pray, O oh God, that your word will even speak to them when they have taken the time to view this content. God bless you and may God keep you.